ABG analysis. Okay, so we're going to break down ABG analysis. We're going to figure out what it is we're looking at, and then we're going to go on to practice interpretation of examples. So in ABG analysis, there's two reasons why you're drawing an arterial blood gas and evaluating it. One reason is acid-base balance, and the second reason is oxygenation. So just there right off the bat, it tells you kind of the approach we're going to take in analyzing these examples. So the first thing you need to know is that you need to memorize these normals because without memorizing the normal values, you're not going to be able to compare the patient's values of abnormal or are they normal to what they're supposed to be. So you need to approach it from that physiologic standpoint so you can see if there's any pathophysiology, any abnormalities in your patient's blood gas. So, you know, we don't want you to memorize a lot of things for nursing. We want you to understand and critically think, but there are some things you do need to memorize so you can compare. Second thing, okay, let's talk about what each of these five components represent. So there are five components in an arterial blood gas, and understanding what they all mean is going to help you kind of navigate through the interpretation of our examples. pH, well, what is that? First of all, it's the go-to. When you're, when you're approaching an arterial blood gas, that's the first thing you want to look at is, do we have a balance of acids and bases in the system? So normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So you need to commit that to memory. So what is it that the pH represents? The pH is actually the number of hydrogen ions in the arterial blood. So this is a very important concept because the definition of an acid is that it's a hydrogen ion donor. So the more hydrogen ions there are, the more acidic something is. The only little catch about interpreting the pH is that the number of hydrogen ions was so big that they couldn't put it in kind of a normal number. They need to put it in what's called this logarithm. And I'm not a mathematician, but all I know is that it is a logarithm number, so it's a neat number that we can write. And the other thing that is weird about it is that it's a negative logarithm. So in other words, when the number of hydrogen ions goes up, this pH number is going to go down. So the number of hydrogen ions represented as a negative logarithm, so we know the more hydrogen ions there are, we know that the lower that pH number goes. So let's start out just by labeling that as such. So pH, normal values, make sure you memorize that, and then the lower it goes, the more acidic something is, because a hydrogen ion donor is an acid. And then the higher this number goes, the fewer their hydrogen, the fewer hydrogen ions there are, and it's considered more basic. Another name for basic is alkalemic. Let's look at the second component is CO2. It's arterial CO2. So when we label it, we put a little A there to denote that it's not from the venous blood. The other little notation here is a P. That P represents partial, because if you notice, the CO2 is written as a pressure, millimeters of mercury. So normal being 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury of pressure, partial pressure in the arterial blood. Now why is it a partial pressure? Because there's other gases in the arterial system, the venous system too, but because there are other gases that, you know, comprise all the potential pressure there could be, that's a partial pressure. So that's all that means. You don't have to think about it again, just so you don't wonder what the little PA stands for in front of the CO2 value. So what is CO2 anyway? Well, CO2 we know is a waste product of cellular metabolism. And normally in the blood, there should be 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury of pressure. Now, which system regulates this? The respiratory system. So what this represents is what's called alveolar ventilation. So ventilation, if you break down that terminology, all ventilation means is movement of air. 
So alveolar ventilation is telling us, is there movement of air down in the alveoli? If there is the normal movement of air, then your CO2 level should, should fall between 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. If there's inadequate, insufficient, hypo-ventilation of air in the alveoli, what's going to happen to that CO2 value is that it's going to go up. So alveolar hypoventilation is going to result in a CO2 value that's elevated. And by the same token, alveolar hyperventilation, when there is an excessive amount of movement of air down in the alveoli, is going to drive this CO2 level down. Another kind of a confusing point is that if I just told you that the definition of an acid is a hydrogen ion donor, well, there's no hydrogen ions, there's no H in this value of CO2. And that is because CO2 is what's called a volatile acid. It immediately combines with water in the system to dissociate into what's called carbonic acid or a hydrogen ion is just going to dissociate with CO2 plus H2O. So when you look at this value, you're going to say to yourself, acid. So therefore, the higher this number goes, the more hydrogen ions that are being released or that are dissociated, and the more acidic it is. So we're going to go this way and label this, when the number is higher, acid. And by the same token, when we hyperventilate and we're blowing off, these carbon, this carbonic acid, then we're going to label this as alkalemic or more basic. So now we've done kind of half of what we need to know about interpretation of acid-base balance because the first thing we look at is the actual balance and then what we do is we look to the two systems that could have created an imbalance. And we just talked about one of the two systems. The one of the two systems is the respiratory system represented by CO2 as alveolar ventilation. The other system that regulates acid-base balance in the body is the renal system, also called the metabolic mechanism. So there's two possible underlying causes of an acid-base imbalance, and those two causes are either a respiratory problem or a metabolic problem that's regulated by the kidneys. So let's look at the second component or second feature that could have created an imbalance. So remember, when there is a pH issue, we're going to look to see which one caused it. So with the bicarb, what is it that we're looking at? We're looking at pure base. Now, what's the definition of a base? The definition of a base is that it's a hydrogen ion recipient. So it's kind of the opposite of what an acid is. So in looking at this bicarbonate, this pure base, that is regulated by the metabolic system or the kidneys. So the kidneys either manufacture bicarbonate, make it in order to buffer acids, or it excretes hydrogen ions along the renal tubule. So that's the way it helps balance those acids and bases in the body, either in response to a respiratory problem or it's doing it because it has a problem. So again, when you're looking at the pH, we want to see which one caused it. The other one's going to compensate for it. So we're going to get to compensation. Okay, back to bicarb. Normal. Now it's not a partial pressure like CO2 was. It's in milliequivalents per liter. So we just label it differently. Normal values of this base or bicarbonate is 23 to 28 milliequivalents per liter. So we know that when our patient's value deviates from this, that there is either a primary metabolic imbalance or it's compensating for a primary respiratory imbalance. Again, we'll get to that. Okay, so with that being said, if this value of bicarbonate goes up, are we looking at something that's more acidic or more alkalemic? We're looking at something that's more alkalemic. So we're going to label that as such, just so we keep that straight. 
Okay, this, this next concept is a little weird to wrap your head around because when our bicarbonate value is lower, even though it's pure base you're looking at, it's representing an acid. Why? Because it's showing you that there's an environment that's acidic and that bicarbonate is buffering all those acids, driving this number down. So when we look at the value, the value is going to be decreased and we're going to label this acid. Okay, and we'll get to examples where you kind of see what I mean that for some reason it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that a lower bicarbonate number, even though it's base, means in it. it's an acidic value. So it's so important to memorize those normals. Okay, well, we pretty much talked all about acid-base balance. Almost, there's a little bit of an influence of oxygenation on acid-base balance, but of the two reasons to do an arterial blood gas, we just talked about one of the two, so we're halfway there. Second reason is we wanna look at oxygenation. So the two components left is the PaO2. Same little Pa as we saw with the carbon dioxide, meaning partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. It is in a pressure normal, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Now keep in mind that when we give the patient supplemental oxygen, that this number, this value can go way past 100. We can put all kinds of oxygen and you know, really increase those pressures, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's good. You know, sometimes more and more is not good because we run into something called oxygen toxicity, but we're not gonna talk about that. Now just keep in mind, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury is normal. And then when we start dipping below like 60 to 80, well, we're talking about a mild, what's called hypoxemia. And hypoxemia refers to a diminished value of this partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. So a hypoxemia really is referring to this value of PaO2 versus hypoxia, which is referring to a deficiency of oxygen at the cellular level. So there is that distinction that you need to know, be familiar with. Okay, so 40 to 60 is also hypoxemic. That's considered a moderate hypoxemia and less than 40 is considered a severe hypoxemia. So just know anything lower than 80 is considered hypoxemic, but then there are levels of hypoxemia. O2 saturation, what is that? Well, it's different from the PaO2 in that it's not a partial pressure, it's a percent. So what is it a percent of? It's the percent of hemoglobin that is bound to oxygen in comparison to how much oxygen the hemoglobin can hold. Well, we are one system, and that one system can be filled up 100% with oxygen. There, there is that potential, but it can't exceed 100%, unlike the PaO2 where you can. And the second question that I always want answered here with the PaO2 and the O2 set is, is there a correlation? Why give both? Well, you're giving both because, you know, unlike the quick and dirty pulse oximeter that we get that oxygen value from just kind of continuously at the bedside. It's very convenient. We're able to look a little deeper at oxygenation when we're able to see what the arterial blood is doing and uh, what the partial pressure of oxygen is exactly. So let's look at the correlation between the PaO2 and the O2 saturation. And we have this dreaded oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which we're only going to look at in terms of these correlates. So with the vertical being the O2 saturation and the horizontal being the PaO2, you see that when the PaO2 is 60 millimeters of mercury, it's a beautiful thing because the O2 saturation is still at 90%. And as we go higher and higher on the curve, we could have started this way and moved backwards, but we're just starting right at the meat of the matter that this is where that it, it kind of ends in terms of good oxygenation. So that is the point. When the PaO2 is 60 millimeters of mercury and we're at O2 set of 90, you know what? You better get out your oxygen mask, your non-rebreather, and you know, call in the troops because the patient has no more room to decompensate. You're done. If you go below 60, your O2 sat is gonna plummet. So as we're going a little bit higher than 60, you see how this 
S-shaped curve is kind of flattened out, that the O2 set is only going to increase by very small amounts or increments, 90, 92, 94, as that O2 set goes up. If you have an O2 set of 95%, you're practically at a PaO2 of 100, which we said was right in that normal range. So the point is, try to keep your, quote, normal patients or your non-end stage COPD patients, 95 or above, that's where you're safe. If you're hovering around 90, no good, because you have nowhere to go but decompensation.